Lizzie Caterino, welcome to Cure, my debut cardistry DVD project. My name is Ekaterina, welcome to Pure, my debut cardistry DVD project. It took a lot of time and work in the making, but I really think it's worthwhile because it really has something for everyone, advanced, intermediates, and beginner flourishes. I really hope you take the time to practice and follow along with me here on this journey. It is a combination of personal discoveries, variations from pre-existing concepts, as well as original material. So without further ado, let's get started. This is the candle spread, one of my favorite moves to do on stage and it has a very nice reaction from Layman. Um, I discovered this move while playing around with the flower fan. Now what I noticed is that it gives a natural bend to the deck and afterwards I just really wanted to modify an arm spread which is usually done um, you know, horizontally. So I wanted to do it vertically and actually have it as a self-standing spread. And uh, this is it. I hope you enjoy the overview. This is what it looks like. You may or may not want to use a flower fan. It depends how comfortable you are with it. You're not obliged to use it, but I use it in order to obtain the bend. I mean, you could simply obtain the bend by bending the cards also. Now from here, I just spread it vertically on my arm. Now notice how it goes all the way up to your shoulder. I spread backwards, hold with my thumb and let go. This is a surprise effect for your audience. You can bring it up in a vertical position and you just release the thumb and everything will fall. Now let me get into the steps. Step number one is actually to obtain the bend. Now like I said, you can go shortcut, just perform the bend, and then go right onto your arm. I prefer combining this simple spread, which is pretty simple, with a difficult move, which is the flower fan. And for me, that gets more reaction on stage. So. You perform the flower fan. Now, what you want here is really to obtain a really good bend. So once you got your bend, I would close it and then start spreading on my arm. Now, you want to apply some pressure, but also apply some air in between the cards by just squeezing. So, squeeze and spread it by applying pressure it can go pretty far because it's a vertical position. So now I'm clearing my elbow and as I clear my elbow, I start spreading backwards. Now this is where you might have trouble because cards may get stuck. So just make sure it's, it's just a pressure thing, how much pressure you're applying. Now here, my thumb goes under and it will hold everything at this point. So now the only really fragile point here is this top section. You're just going to carefully put it upwards. Now notice how this top portion will move a little bit. Now in order to close it, I put my hand under it and all I'm doing is releasing the pressure from the thumb. So you release the pressure from the thumb and everything slides back into place. You make sure to open your fingers so they don't get stuck because if you don't open all your fingers, it's going to get stuck and fall. Now let's follow along.
In conclusion, this kind of spread is really good for stage. Like I said, I use it all the time in my life, performances. Now, what a lot of people have been telling me is that they're afraid that while bending the cards, it's going to ruin the deck or it's going to stay that way. So, actually, right after I finish performing it, I perform a pole spread, and that just makes my card straight again. So it's not really a problem for me. When it's a really broken in deck, this bend is not really a problem. You just do this and it goes back to normal. So I didn't really face that problem. Um, you can learn the flower fan from different sources. Jeff McBride thought it as the Rolo deck. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty much out there and it's all about pressure really. If you watch this slowly and try to do it and play around with pressure, you'll get it, essentially. You just need also air in between the cards. Essentially, it is not difficult, but it has a strong effect. And just play with the element of surprise, of dropping your hand, and the cards still holding. I hope you enjoy it. The D-square is one of my favorite one-handed moves. It's complicated, but at the same time it shows that not every single move has to be really quick, but it can be done so it's with like a slow style to it. And this idea is a, works with the concept of perching. Now, I saw this with pictures that was sent to me by Dimitri Arleri from France, and I found it just amazing how a square could be integrated within a sequence of perching. And so this is the method, and I thank him for helping me in this process and getting to what I'm going to show you now more in depth. The D-square overview looks like this. You're turning over one card on top. And then you're gonna out jog a card from the bottom, and then a second card gets out jogged. And the top card is turned over to form this display. Now, from here, before forming the square, you're going to form the triangle. So the triangle is formed, displayed, and then the square is formed. And you close. And now, Let's see this in more details. Before we go to, into the actual D-square move, I do want to show you two prerequisites. It's going to be separate square and per perching. So let me show you how to do the square without the obstruction of the perching. So first, you're going to start with a thumb cut. All right, so you're cutting with your thumb. Now notice, it's very important to have some cards here. It will be like a platform for another wall. Now, your fingers are just going to go under and lift the whole thing. Now notice when I lift with my fingers, I am also moving my wrist downwards. And that allows me to hook one card with my thumb, so only one or two. One is preferable, and you just let go of the rest. And now this little platform is going to stabilize that wall. Now what your middle finger is going to do is drag one card on the side and pull downwards. And use the other edge, which is another little platform there. So your fingers come and help you. And here it's so stable that you can actually let go with your thumb. After you've done that, you have to break this wall first and the top will fall with it. So get ready to receive these cards with your thumb, so you break that wall, and then your thumb just comes and closes everything. Now this was the square. Let me show you the perching.
this is D-square, the part two of the prerequisites, so it's the perching. But before we get into the perching, there is a turnover of a card that I do. Now, you can use any of your favorite methods. It, it really doesn't matter how you're going to get that card there. I mean, you could even twist it, but let me show you one method. The one I prefer is just pushing the card on the side, and then your middle earring ring and your thumb are just going to move towards the edge, and it's just going to fall naturally. And I think that's just the easiest way to do it. Now you're going to go into the cradle grip. So cards are stable. And then it's sort of like a hot shot kind of get ready where you're just going to go into the bottom of the deck, cut, and then get your index in there and out jog a card out. Now notice your middle finger is there to block it. So it's out jog but towards that kind of perpendicular way. And that's what you want, sort of like holding a gun. Now, in the same opening, you need to insert your ring finger and do the reverse. Now, in this method, what I'm doing is spidering the card, like pivoting it, with my ring pulling down and my middle finger pulling up. So I'm pulling down and up. And notice how the pinky this time is the one that's going to determine where that stops. And then you let go. And here's an important tip. The thing is, the ring and your index are going to be the control of these two bottom cards. So they will never be perfect. That's why you have to adjust them. If you feel you need more space to turn over that card and for it to land here, you need to push them out more or push them in. So you really control those two cards. Now, it's a very unnatural grip at first, but when you get used to it, you just move with the cards. Now, when that's there, and I still keep this for stability, but you don't have to. Then you're just going to pull with your middle and get that card there. I use my middle finger to push myself a little opening for my middle finger to go to the opening. Now here you might need to square and the way you would square is with your thumb just pulling and it squares everything pretty well. Now you do need to square because when you're going to start the actual square <laughs> thumb cut, you're going to need everything into position. So here's your first phase of the thumb cut. Now here, very important, you need to lift the whole sculpture. Like I mentioned earlier, your wrist goes down. Now very important because if, if it doesn't go down, then this card will fall off. So you make sure this is parallel with the ground. So you go up. Once again, you have to only hook one card with your thumb and start to release and let it go down and move your hands and wrists to accommodate the motion. Don't move this part. So here you hook it up, your thumb lifts, and there you're simply going to get that card to pop out, complete. Like I said here, it's a bit shakier than simply doing a square, but normally you can let go and it will hold there for a moment. Break that wall, close. Here I just like to close by putting on top and just pivoting these out and putting everything on top. Now let's try to follow along.
To conclude the D square move, you are going to run into a few problems and I just want to address them right now. I mean, some of you will say that your thumb is not long enough. Um, let me assure you that I don't really have big hands. So if, if I can do it, if I can reach, you could also. But one thing that will help you is also having your wrist move in a way that you can reach. So I just lift my entire sort of elbow and um, front part of my hand. And at the same time, I'm, I'm holding the deck away from my thumb, which allows me to get a, a bigger reach. Now also, sometimes the packet bends a little bit to help me, so it's not actually straight, it, I just bend a little bit, and that just help, helps me reach it. So that, that should not be a problem with practice. The other thing that might be difficult is to, you know, get inside the same opening with the ring finger and just getting it out. Just make sure you rewatch it and you know it's going the right direction, so that's going to help you. I mean, I know it's not easy and I haven't seen a lot of people do it besides me and I just hope you really take the time to do it. And I've performed this countless times with Layman and they seem to really enjoy the slow, complex progression of the entire display. So thank you. It was a nightmare. The false L cuts utilize a move by Jerry Zaskowski. Thank you, Jerry, for this amazing move that I use all the time. I love it. So you can learn it from the Encyclopedia of Playing Card Flourishes. It's absolutely amazing. So I'll be going it over that move really briefly here. Uh, but basically, the idea of making it false came to me from an artiste français, Antoine Thomas, again from France, and um, I just found it great. So I'm going to teach you the method right now. Here's what the brief overview looks like. Simply cutting here. And then the difference is that you're putting it back on top and recutting it with your thumb. And then you've not mixed any of the cards. Which is pretty cool and can fool cardists, I guess. <laughs> so I'll teach you that in more detail with each hand. Let's do it step by step. You're gonna hold it just in this grip, doesn't really matter. As long as you can reach out with your thumb and cut here. It's basically starting like a regular L cut, but it's gonna change at some point here. So your pinky is going to push up while your ring finger is sort of there helping. So you're pushing it there up, and it's sort of staying in between your fingers. So it's cutting them equally and it forms an L shape. Now from here what you're going to do different from the L cut method is you're just going to bring everything back up with your thumb. Okay, and here you're, you're keeping a break with your ring finger because you don't want to mix these packets. What you want to do is reopen that from the break and lift with your pinky again and then connect them and they have not been shuffled. So let me show you with two hands what it looks like. So you're cutting here, your pinky pushes up, while here you're guiding that packet in between your fingers, cutting them in the middle here. And then here you're gonna bring this back to the top with your thumbs, so it's back here, maintained with a break. Your thumb then comes here and cuts again, you lift with your pinky, and that's pretty much it. You remember which packet went on top, obviously, because you don't want to mix these. That's the false L cut.
Now, in order to make it look good, you want to mimic the motion of a nail cut, which will mask the fact that you're bringing that packet back on top. Now, if you don't do that, it looks really obvious that you're not doing the nail cut. So the goal here is to really mimic the flare of an nail cut, so when I'm putting that packet back on top, it doesn't appear, or barely appears, which can fool your eye a little bit. But the fun part is that it looks like a nail cut, and you can still use it as a false cut. The running nail cut, however, is not possible because you only have two runs with that, so you can't really do this more than two times. But like you saw, it's very similar to the nail cut, which is this. So instead of that, you only have two runs, bringing it back on top. And there we have it. Let's go into the follow along. Conclusion for this move, don't use your thumbs as an excuse. I mean, I can do it and it takes practice. That's all it's going to take. The L cuts are not an easy cut, by the way. And if you do want to learn the running L cuts as well as other cool things with it, definitely check out Jerry's book, The Encyclopedia Playing Card Flourishes, and just practice. It's very deceptive, the false L cuts, and I really hope you do use it. So, that's it. is my experimentation with fans and arm spreads, which you can both learn from the Encyclopedia of Playing Card Flourishes as a very good source. Now I'm using the giant fan as well, I'm stripping up some cards and I'm creating a spread on top of that. I mean, it was just pure experimentation with stripping out cards and it just got stuck, so it was a nice accident where I actually found that it's a good platform to actually spread the cards afterwards. It's a little bit difficult, but still very much doable if you do know your Pharaoh Shuffle, your Giant Fan, and your Arm Spreads. So let's start. For the brief overview, we're going to go into the Pharaoh right away. So you cut the deck, push down for your Pharaoh. It's essentially based on a lot of pressure. 
Now it helps to have a pretty ferrule. You're not going to insert it too much into this packet, but it does have to be inside. Now you notice it's out jogged to the left in order to display the front. And so you display the front. You come back and here you do your strip out. Just stripping out the corner since it's already out jogged. It's pretty easy to do that. You form your platform for the spread. You spread. Gravity allows you to have it down, strip it out, and balance the fan on top of the stripped out packet. You can either toss it or just take it, close it, and you've just done it. Let me separate it into more steps for you. This is in-depth fan rail. You're gonna go into a ferrule. Now it doesn't have to be perfect and you can use any of your preferred method to get into that. I'll just show you the one I do. Now it doesn't have to be perfect once again, but it helps. Now you're gonna insert it, but just slightly, not too much because you do wanna strip it out easily. Now here, it's out jogged towards the left because I'm going to display the front of the cards and it looks prettier that way. If I were displaying the back, I would have it on the right. So here, giant fan, and I display. Now from here I go down, see my thumb is already there, ready to strip out, so my hand comes in stripping out. You will hear like unclick, like it unclicks, and at the same time, my left hand is sort of pivoting, so I pivot in order for me to unclick everything, so strip it out. Now I stop here and I just square everything and angle it so it's going across the fan. Because essentially I'm going to just take that little packet and spread it. Now notice I can't go too far because it will fall at some point, so that's that's far enough. See here, it's pretty much the top I can go. Now your right hand comes downwards and will receive the cards falling. You're just going to incline your left hand and gravity in straight line everything will fall. You're going to use your thumb here to help push and unclip everything. You can square a little bit and then you're going to balance the fan on this surface. Now there's a lot of cards, so this should not be complicated. Now you could either toss it and catch it, or just take it, close it, and there you go. It's pretty easy when you know all the prerequisite steps. Once again, for fan rail, it helps to know the giant fan and notice how I'm applying a lot of pressure with my thumb to keep everything together when I'm stripping out the cards so they don't get dragged along with that strip out. So make sure a lot of pressure with your thumb. It helps to know the ferro and a lot of you have even better methods to ferro the cards than I do, so please use them. And just remember the out jog on the cards which makes the giant fan prettier. Essentially just experiment, I mean, fan and arm spreads together, just find your own ideas from that point on, and I hope you really play with it.
Melody Shuffle is my very first original flourish creation and I'm just really proud of it. It's very simple and it's taking the concept of the overhand shuffle and changing it. I really hope you take the time to learn it. It just really looks great and I have many magic applications to it as well. But here it is as a flourish. Let's take a look. overview of the Felity Shuffle. You could even start with a regular overhand shuffle. It has the same starting position, but then your index is going to extend, capture a card, you're going to cut and bring it back. Extend and cut. And you can do it with single cards or actually several cards, like packets. And let's get into the details. Here's how you do this. Like I said, it's an overhand shuffle position. Now you can either just drop cards like this or you can peel them off with the thumb. For speed purposes, I prefer peeling them off. And I actually prefer single cards rather than dropping off and picking packets of cards. It just makes it more clean for me. So let me teach you the version I actually perform and what I'm doing here. So I'm cutting. Here I want to peel off one card and then insert my index and it will contact the next card. The next card is going to get extended out of the packet. And here you're just going to do this cut, which is a clearing. So you clear on the other side. And then you can drop off that card, which puts you in perfect place to peel off another card. And then once again, contact with your index finger extend out and here just a simple little cut and bring everything back now up to speed it looks like this see sometimes i get a single card sometimes i get two cards it depends and you just finish it off like that let's follow along For those who are wondering, felity actually means family of cats. So for those who are wondering, it comes from the word like feline also. So that's just to clarify that. And it's really easy. Use it. I mean, a lot of magic applications with it as well. Uh, I mean, just the fact that you can see the cards and you can sort of even cut on top if you want it and control that card to the top is a little idea I can give you regarding magic, but I use it as a flourish and it's just a nice element of surprise to start with the regular one and just have this like chopping motion afterwards. Just have fun with it. It was a nightmare. Felity Sybil definitely comes from the Felity Shuffle. 
But what I like about it is that when I perform live, very often I have to perform with vertical moves. So by including the belly shuffle into a cymbal, I do obtain that, that aspect of just the audience being able to see what I'm doing. I still consider this cut very close up, so I would perform it close up instead of, of stage. And then I just added a little packet toss, which I found interesting. But you do need to know the Sybil cut by Chris Scanner for this move. So make sure you know it, and let's get into the brief overview. You're gonna start with a Sybil. Now that's a prerequisite, so I assume you know it. So you're here, and then the next packet you cut is going to be Felly Shuffle, cut back, and here, vertical toss of the packet. Let's take a look at the details of that. You're going to start with a regular Sibum, so you get into your Z grip, and then with your index finger, cut the top packet. Now relax that packet comfortably, grab the middle packet with your middle and thumb of the left hand and extend here. Maintain the script packet. Now here you're in a position to perform this spell you shuffle like transition and it happens vertically so all the packets right now are shown. Please do refer to the spell you shuffle for this move. Now here you're grabbing that packet like in a Sybil, and here again you're clearing it the same way the Foley Shuffle goes. You would grab that one again with the middle and thumb, and you're in a position where you can toss this packet. Now the toss happens with the index finger tossing it. The thumb is just there for support, so upward motion, so it looks like this. And then you close, but let me show this one more time. So you're there, you cut again, regular civil move, belly shuffle, grab it, belly shuffle, civil move, and then you're here, you relax those packets, and you toss vertically, and you complete it. The cut. Let's follow along. Conclusion for this move, please do learn the Sybil and do master the Felly Shuffle before attempting it. I, I just find it's an interesting way to finish it off with a little toss. I just like to use aerials sometimes in between my cuts. So just learn it, it's not really difficult and it gives you a vertical aspect of a cut that's usually performed horizontally. The final 
plan is quite an interesting personal discovery of mine because I was really just trying to do something and an accident happened and that's the this, this plan. But I, I went through many stages. I mean, first I was doing it by just colliding those packets and it would form, you know, a fan. And then I, I started displaying it and then I turned it into a funnel. So it's just been through weird process. But this method, to me, it was not very consistent. And I'm a live performer most of the time and I just needed a consistent method. So instead, I'm using the EF grip, which is actually a grip uh, published by some of um, JS Link's work. So if you want to know more about it and the variations upon that grip, check out JS Link's work. And I'll cover that in more detail in the next section. overview of the funnel fan. Again, a deck separation. Now from here, you're going to go into the BF grip on both sides, but I'm just pushing it way more and beveling it. And then both hands are sort of taking motion, releasing, fanning, and then knuckle to knuckle, and then you go towards yourself to adjust the funnel, and you got yourself a funnel fan. Now the clothes is a bit messy, but it works. And that's that, so let's just learn it in a few more steps. In order to get it into the smooth, you're going to go through the PF grip, and with permission from BS Link, let me give you a brief um, description of that. So from the cradle grip, you're just going to switch your thumb position, two fingers are going to go in, and your index is going to go on top. Now as it goes on top, you will notice that it will also bevel and push a good chunk of cards on the side, so it's spread. Now let me show you one more time, thumb, and then spread. This is a very steady grip. so. That's why I switched it to this one, actually. So now, you're going to go upwards, and two things are going to happen. First of all, your pinky is going to push down. At the same time, you're going to let go of the index finger, and you're going to catch everything with your thumb. So, like this. Okay. I'm going to do this one more time. Go here, up, and catch. And now, from this position, you're just spreading like a one-handed fan, okay? And that's all you're doing here. You're going to do the same thing with both hands. So let me show you that. Both hands into the grip, spread. You can see how far it's beveled. Both hands go up. I sometimes even display it this way. Up. Release. Both are going to spread, apply a lot of pressure here. And now you're going to display it knuckle to knuckle, which is a nice kind of wing of cards. And then you're just going to squeeze inside, and that's going to sort of roll it into a fan, funnel. So that's the funnel fan. To close it, I just reopen that and try to push everything forwards. It is a bit messy, there's no way to avoid that, but it still closes itself. So let's just follow along.
conclude this move, I'd like to say that it just, it's a knack. To, to fall it and catch it is just a knack. You move, it's not that difficult. And the clothes, clothes can be messy, but it's still doable. I still hope you, you try it out and enjoy it. It's just really fun to do. The K Diamonds routine is a variation of D square. Now I took the D square and made a lot of variations, but this is one of my favorite ones. It's actually even easier than D square, but looks more complicated. It uses both hands, so I hope you enjoy it. This is a brief overview for the K diamond routine. So let's just separate the two. Now both hands are going to perform the perching sequence of the D square. Now notice you're not going to have a turned over card there. And that actually allows you to display. Let me show you what it looks like. Now from this display, you're just going to collide both hands together and form a diamond shape. Now from this shape, you're simply going to continue inserting one into the other and then you're going to balance everything on your watch. Now I'll be covering different watches later on and how to spin from there. And then you simply close, and it's actually easier than the D-square. Let's go into more details now. Let's get to the first step, which is separating the two packets. I assume everyone can do that, so let's just go straight ahead into the sequence where you have jog the top card and then another one so from here depending if you're better with your right or left you're, you're gonna struggle a little bit so I would say concentrate on the hand like look at the hand you're not really um, fluid with now from here it helps to square when your middle fingers um, just face each other that's just naturally aligning these cards. I don't know really how to explain this, but it just naturally goes there. So from there, you want your pinky to join, like sort of a cradle grip, but a bit modified. And then your thumb joins the other way. And that's a very steady grip now, because these cards can no longer fall and can be displayed. And that is a nice display for Lena. Now from here, I'm just colliding the two packets, but what I'm doing is with my right hand, middle finger, I'm pulling down and it pops up a card, pulling down and pops up a card, and then, well, depends which hand you prefer, you can do it either way, I just hook a few cards here, and then I just press everything together, and by doing so slowly, it will form the diamond shape. So it's actually very easy to get here. Now to close is also natural because it just naturally closes in itself. Now from here you just have to gotta like liberate one hand. So I prefer to liberate my left hand since my watch is on my left. Now you're gonna place it directly on the watch. And from here you can square if you need to. Now you can add a spin to that. 
which is doable if you have a convex surface. Right here for explanation purposes, I have a very large watch with a really flat surface. So that's another option. You don't have to do the spin because it does get risky. So you can keep it on a flat surface and it's still impressive because it's still in equilibrium. So to just close it, you lift, strip out each single card, and you're done. It's pretty simple, but let's follow along. To conclude this move, like I said, it's basically the only challenge you might find is doing it in both hands. And you really need to just practice each hand separately and then put them together. And like I said, I usually concentrate on my weakest hand. Also when you're finalizing the diamond display, you might notice that the card here might tend to fall. So you have your pinky here and it can help you to just raise it up and it can control that card. So, these are my tips for that move. Hope you enjoyed it. It was a nightmare. The Moonwalk Fan is actually a variation from The Moonwalk by E. Kent. Now, Kent did this amazing combo that I really loved and was completely false. He has a lot of false routines. And so this one, I broke it up a little bit. Uh, I inserted a fan in between because I felt it broke the pattern and layman appreciated it more. It's still completely false and it can be utilized in many of your routines, either in magic or cardistry. So, let's get into the brief overview. Briefly, the moonwalk fan is just out jogging, pack it from the middle, clipping, twirl out, twirl inwards, flare from there on, formation of a fan in between display, and close. 
And now you do have to go into more stats. So let's get into it. The first step is going to be out jogging a really small portion of the middle. So I just out jog it like this and that allows me to grip these corners really quickly. So I out jog a little packet and then I clip it in between my right ring finger and my left thumb like this. And then my middle finger is pivoting out and then I have a clip here which is simply this. So from the beginning, out jog packet, pivot, clip, out, roll on the thumb. Now this is going to be easier in the follow along section, so here I'm just going to tell you um, that you're just pinching the packet, it's still connected here, you're going to hook it again, like a clip, so you clip it, you go over that, and then you display the fan and you close and it maintained the order. So let me show it one more time. You've done that, let's pivot it out and notice the flare. The flare is really hard to explain so you do have to go into the follow along section. And notice I open up this clip packet when my fan is open as well and I close it when I close my fan. So it's going to be a lot easier to just follow along in this next section. The moonwalk fan, as you saw, is a combination of cuts and definitely means a lot of steps to learn. But you just have to follow along and you'll get it. It's very easy to do once you get the steps done. So just utilize this as much as you can. I use it all the time. Thanks.
This is the Russian Pyramid. It's one of my favorite displays and a lot of magicians that know of me, they when they meet me, they, they ask me to show them the Russian Pyramid. Now, I definitely need to give some background. I mean, Joey Burton has been doing stuff with triangles in the form of pyramids for a very long time, even before I ever started. So definitely a credit to him. Now, it also been published as a move on the table, a pyramid on the table by Jerry Setskowski. So go check out the Encyclopedia of Playing Card Flourishes, many great things there, and the pyramid on the table version, which I also love. So in here, I'm just showing you a personal discovery method to achieve it, and let's take a look at what it looks like. This is what the Russian pyramid looks like. You're just separating in two packets and getting ready for Brian Tudor's Revolution 3. Now you're not going to complete it till the end. You're stopping in mid position, separating, inserting everything together, forming thus the first triangle. And then pressure allows you to release some packets and now you have three triangles. And this is what I used to call the topless pyramid. And this point to this point is very easy. Now what gets complicated is actually completing the top of the pyramid. It took me about a month of practice of doing this. And it's a very fragile position. And you do have to do it slowly. So from here, you just close. And let's learn it step by step. This is how you get into the topless pyramid. Just a simple deck separation. From there, I'm not going to go in detail about the Revolution 3, but essentially you're cutting one third the top. And your thumb sort of collides sort of with your fingertips and just drag it over so it goes over that packet. Your fingertips receive those packets and just get in there and open it up. From there, you squeeze with your thumbs and you insert everything together. This is, is pretty solid right now. Now you're applying a lot of pressure and when you release that pressure and your index finger falls down, you're able to complete the topless pyramid. Now from this position, it's very unstable now to go into the, the real formation of the top, but I'll show you anyway, you're just going to shift the top packet in order to liberate the top card and you really need to have that top card on the edge angle because that's what's going to make it rise up when you pull down with your thumb. Now if it's not on the edge it's not going to pull down. Now from here the other one make sure you do this slowly and you've got it. Now at this point this is very fragile. It was easy up to until this point. So you're just gonna close. Now it doesn't really matter how you close it, but I prefer closing it by just bringing this up using my middle finger to push that one up and it sort of closes like a book. When you're like this, you sort of pinch that and you're done. Let's follow along for this one.
The Russian pyramid is really a fun move, it's a fun display. However, I know you will struggle with the last two cards there and to get it on top, it's not easy. I know it's a knacky move, it took me personally a month to get any consistency out of that. And you have really no excuse actually, it takes practice and there is a girl called uh, Dania. And she learned that from me, the pyramid, and she does it really, really well. So if two girls can do this move, you really have no excuse. So I hope you enjoy it. The Sputnik fan is really a solution for me for my one-handed fan closure. I mean, it's just really awkward for me here and I find it's very hard to reposition yourself. So what I wanted to accomplish with the Sputnik fan was to make it into a twirl fan transition. So it would be instantaneous and you could just get into the position as quickly as possible. So let's get into the brief overview. For a brief overview, you're simply pushing downwards with your index finger, it gets into the crease and then you pivot and then it's a one-handed spread. It's very hard to do slowly so I'll do it once again, you get into the position, the close is simply with gravity and you let everything go and that's your twirl in. So the twirl motion is your pivot here, close and back. So you can do it over and over again. So let me show it to you with more details. To start, you're going to take your index finger and push the deck lower. As you push it lower, you have three fingers from your right hand placed in this weird position, but you're just going to get into it. Right, so your index is on the bottom, middle on top, and the thumb on top. So you drag it into the pivot point. This is your pivot point, all right? So this push is like a little bit of a gravity fall, and that helps you initiate that. Now you notice the spread is already initiated, so you go into your regular one-handed fan. So push down, pivot, and spread regularly. Now notice because of the gravity, you do get a wider spread so you can see the cards better. So from here to close, very simple. On your fingertips, you just let go, gravity will let it drop, pivot it back. And then you notice you're back again in the position and you can do this over and over again. Now let's follow along. This move is a bit knacky when you're trying to learn how the gravity helps you actually spread it wider, but it is 
very simple. So once you get the technique down and the knacky little aspect of it, it should flow. I really hope you play with it and some problems you may encounter is really the twisting motion and you just have to go with the natural bevel of that twist. So you follow the bell and knowing the one-handed fan is definitely prerequisite so make sure you know that your thumb goes up and your fingers curl down as well as pressure. So there you go. This is stage remora. It's a variation from the remora cut or display by Jay Fry. I've modified it in order to adapt it to my stage routine and it's actually a move that I do at the very end. So it's a big build up, it's a multi-phase display and it really plays really well with laymen because they're able to follow and a little bit understand what you're forming there. And so it's a nice eight packet display that I hope you will enjoy. So let's get into the brief overview. Here's what it looks like. You're cutting into three packets, four, five, that's the sixth one, seven is going to go up to your chin. And then eight is the final split. Now, essentially, you're utilizing all your fingers. And I'm putting it in the side of my chin so I can talk and actually smile even. So the close is whatever you want, actually. But I prefer doing this. Liberating pressure from packets that are really tense. Let me show you the same thing, but in more detail in the next section. Step number one, you're going to start in a cradle grip and from this point your right hand is simply going to cut with pulling your index downwards, cutting with your index here on top, grabbing it like a sibyl, it's basically like a sibyl opening and then you're in this triangle position. From here, see your pinky is there so this is a place where you can separate the packets so you separate the packets and now you have four packets from here you're gonna switch finger position you're gonna put your index here so these fingertips are free to separate yet another card so this packet is very available so I'm just going to clip off a card here and that's five card display right here now the only here, as you can see, I can no longer pick up a card. The only place I can actually clip off a card is here. So it's the separation between your index and middle finger of your right hand. And it's a bit tense for me, but it should be fine for your size of fingers. So you pull it off and you display six packets now. At this point, you feel a bit of tension, but it's, it's not so difficult really. It's just clipping cards and holding them in position. If you can do a Sybil, this should be easy. So from here, you're going to separate with your pinky. Actually, the both pinkies will play a role here, here and separate in two. And you're going to bring a packet to your chin. So you're putting it onto your chin now. And you freed the left hand. Now, as you notice here, I have a pinky that can cut again and now I've liberated one more card and that's your final formation. From here you pause of course <laughs> and then you close it this way. Here I just perform a little scissorish cut. I pick up the one 
near my chin because it's the most tense. And then this one, this one, and here I just clip it, extend, and finish it off like that. You don't have to close it that way. I don't really have one way of closing it. Sometimes one packet is more tense than the other. That's the one I grab because you don't really want to screw up and just have all the cards on the floor at the end. So let's go into follow along. It's really something you have to follow along to get it. So just pick up a deck of cards and let's go. Stage Remora is a very effective move for a live audience and it has this look of difficulty and that's what you want to create in people. When they're watching it, you want it to feel like it's very difficult but it's very simple. If you're just holding the packets right and just clipping it, it's pretty stable. So you shouldn't have any problem with that display. Definitely use it and definitely try to perform it live. This move is part of my experimentation with table work and it was part of my round for the tournament and some of uh, this idea came from Jay also who said, you know, just surf the box and uh, it's very simple. It really doesn't take any prior requirements rather than just knowing how to simply spread the deck on a table. So let me give you a brief overview. The surf box, it's your box, 
surfing on the turnover of a spread, which is spread vertically. So let me show you. You're here, you're spreading on the short edge. You have the turnover, you hook the box on the turnover and it surfs along the turnover. And then you just receive it from the card inside and it just scoops everything back into the box. And now let me show you everything more in depth. First, you're going to need to prepare your box very briefly. So essentially, your box looks like this. What you're going to do is just insert the flaps and bend them so they stay inside because sometimes they can get on your way. You're going to get the main flap and you notice there's two folds possible there. You're just going to use the top fold, the first one, and really crease it. Make sure it's really creased. That way, it forms a little like triangle sort of and that will hook the box so let's see the spread all you're gonna do is a simple spread when you start the turnover you lift and as you lift with your middle finger you're just gonna position the box on top like this now it's very important your left hand is gonna control the other side of the spread and that will also control the speed of the serve. Now, if you do it slowly, it's gonna be very steady and it stayed there. And you can do this several times. Now, when you're ready, you're gonna just push more with your middle finger right here. You just push more and it's gonna propulse it. So it's received by your right hand. You're just gonna start by scooping them back into the box. Now, notice the fact that the flaps are folded inside. They're just not blocking. And now you can start scooping that way. And I also help myself by um, scooping with the other hand as well. So it goes quicker. It's very, very simple. You get everything into the box, you close, and you're done.